Good afternoon to everyone again. And once again, if anyone's visiting here, welcome. We're so thankful that you're here to worship God with us. There's just one further announcement to what you heard this morning, and that's concerning Bible study. It's scheduled to be held this Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock here in the church building. And they will be studying Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. The call to worship is from Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. These words of doxology or praise from the Apostle Paul. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen says, to him be glory in the church. And that's what we're here for this afternoon. If you're able to, please stand and let's together sing the votum. Help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Our God greets us and blesses us. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Let's praise our God by singing hymn four and then immediately after that we'll stay standing and we'll profess our faith by singing the Apostles' Creed as we have it in hymn one.
ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll now lead you in prayer and we'll ask for God's blessing on us this afternoon as we worship him. O oh God Almighty, we come into your presence this afternoon with adoration for your power. Who is like you, O oh Lord Yahweh? Who is like you, O oh God, glorious in holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. We see your power in creation. You created the world and everything that is out of nothing, merely by the word of your mouth. What awesome power you have. We see your power in the preservation of all you have made. You are the preserver of people and animals. You uphold all things by the word of your power. We see your power in the way you restrain our great enemy, Satan. You restrain the natural corruption of humanity, too. If you didn't do that, if you didn't intervene, the world would become uninhabitable for us. Oh God, we consider your power in judgment, too. We know of how you sent floodwaters over the entire earth in the days of Noah. With your power, you judged the sin of many and saved eight people, just a few. You sent fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Abraham. You brought down the waters on Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea. And at the return of our Savior, you will show your power in judgment again. Father, how thankful we are for Jesus. How thankful we are that we have righteousness and life in him. So we don't have to be afraid that your power will punish us eternally. Because we have Christ. Because we believe in him. We also trust in you. And we trust in your power. Your power is going to always be used for our good. Since you are the stronghold of our lives, our rock, we have nothing and no one to be afraid of. Father, this afternoon we pray that you would teach us to trust you more. Please teach us to follow you more consistently. With your Holy Spirit, please make our hearts open to your leading. We pray for your blessing on our worship and especially on the reading and preaching of your word. We pray in Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Timothy 2. In 1 Timothy 2, we'll read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Listen to God's holy and inerrant word. First of all, then... I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, 
godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And we'll stop there in 1 Timothy 2, and now we'll also turn to 1 John 4. And we'll read this entire chapter. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's turn to our catechism lesson, Lord's Day 14. And you'll find that on page 528 in the Book of Praise. Page 528. And we're going through the articles of the Apostles' Creed here. And here the church confesses from the Word of God, 
What do you confess when you say he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? The eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took upon himself true human nature from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary through the working of the Holy Spirit. Thus, he is also the true seed of David and like his brothers in every respect, yet without sin. What benefit do you receive from the holy conception and birth of Christ? He is our mediator, and with his innocence and perfect holiness, covers in the sight of God my sin, in which I was conceived and born. Beloved congregation of Christ Jesus, reminders are powerful tools in God's hand to maintain us in the Christian life and to make us grow in it. Think of what God speaks to us in 2 Peter 2, or 2 Peter chapter 1, 12 to 13. It says there in 2 Peter 1, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. When Peter wrote that second epistle, he wasn't bringing a lot of anything new to his readers. Much of it was a reminder of what they had been taught previously. But it was important for them to be reminded. He went on to say, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So reminders serve to keep important truths fresh in our minds. And one of those important truths is the first coming of the Lord Jesus. In verse 16 of 2 Peter 1, we read, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So this, the coming of Christ, his first coming, was one of those truths that Peter would always remind his readers about. This is a truth about which we also regularly receive reminders Each year, on December 25th, we're reminded of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The way he came into the flesh. That's what incarnation means. But we also have the regular preaching of our catechism. And as we do that, we come time and again to Lord's Day 14, which considers Article 3 of the Apostles' Creed. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This is one of the most important teachings of the faith. And so it's good that we're regularly reminded about it and that we reflect on it. Well, this afternoon, it's going to happen. We're going to be reminded again of what God's word says about the first coming of our Lord. Perhaps there won't be anything new for you. That's okay. Remember, reminders are important. We'll consider what the Bible teaches about the coming of our Lord to this earth as our mediator. And we find that biblical word mediator in question and answer 36. And before we get into the meat of the sermon, it's really important that we understand what a mediator is, what a mediator does. For you kids especially, the children who are here, Here's what it means. A mediator is a go-between. So a mediator goes between two people who are fighting with each other. And in this instance, the two parties are God and fallen humanity. Fallen man has been rebelling against God. And God's wrath has been aroused by this rebellion. So someone needs to come and take these these two 
God and man and bring them back together again. To reconcile them. And that someone is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the theme of the sermon is, the Son of God came to earth as our mediator. There's two things we'll learn about. We'll learn about how he came from God, and then also that he came for us. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, there's these powerful words. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins or as a propitiation for our sins. Now, there are a few things we ought to take note of here. First of all, it was the eternal Son of God who came for us. The baby who was born in a manger in Bethlehem, had a prior existence and life story. As our catechism puts it, he is and remains true and eternal God. In other words, before his incarnation, he existed in his divine nature. That's why Jesus could say to the Jews in John 8, 58, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. He existed long before Abraham. The eternal Son of God had an agreement to, with the Father to come into this world. And this agreement has a special name in theology. It's sometimes called the covenant of redemption. At other times, it's called the council of peace. You could use either one. It really doesn't matter. But this covenant of redemption, let's just go with that term. This covenant of redemption is not to be confused with the covenant of grace, which I'll talk about in a few moments. This covenant of redemption is the agreement that was made between the Father and the Son before creation. And we find that covenant, the covenant of redemption, Mentioned or implied in several places in Scripture. For example, in several places in the Gospel according to John, Christ speaks of the commandments given to him by the Father. The author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 40, which speaks about the Son coming to do the will of his Father. And there are other passages as well, which speak about promises given to the Son, his obligations to obedience, and the blessings that would follow. And it's clear that under this covenant of redemption, the Father sent his Son into this world for our salvation. And this idea of sending is clear in 1 John 4 verse 9. God sent his only son into the world. The son was sent. And he gladly obeyed. He didn't have to be compelled. He obeyed without any resistance. So his first coming wasn't something he did independently, that that he did all on his own. God the son was sent into this world by God the father. And as he came into this world... He became incarnate. There's another theological term. Incarnate simply means that he took on human flesh. He became a human being. We confess that he took upon himself true human nature. Not only a human body, but also a human soul. That means he was no ordinary human being. When we come into the world, we don't take anything to ourselves. We're conceived and born helpless. But the coming of the Son of God was entirely unique. He was active in it. Notice that he is the active subject of that sentence. He took upon himself true human nature. He took upon himself Not true human nature was bestowed upon him or something like that. No, he did it. 
He took it. Philippians 2 verse 7 says it most clearly in the Bible. It says that Christ made himself nothing. Taking, again, he's the subject, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So our mediator was actively involved in his incarnation. It was attentive and deliberate action on his part. It was all part of his active obedience to the will of the Father who sent him. That's a vitally important point. We'll come back to it in a few moments. For now, let's continue by considering how the incarnation of our Savior took place. Our catechism says that he did this from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary through the working of the Holy Spirit. Well, here we have to right away acknowledge that we're in the realm of mystery. There are things here that we just, we can't understand. There is no clear and easy explanation as to how the eternal Son of God took on a human nature from the flesh and blood of Mary. Theologians have different theories, but there's no direct or explicit biblical explanation as to how our Savior could take on a human nature from Mary, become a human body and soul, and yet remain without sin. All we know is that this is what the Bible teaches us. And in humility, we accept what God says in faith. There is one thing that is abundantly clear from Scripture, and it's that the Holy Spirit was involved in this incarnation. In Luke 1.35, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So somehow... The Holy Spirit was vitally involved in the conception of Jesus. And his involvement ensured that the child to be born would be both man and God. Truly divine and truly human, but without sin. Moreover, we ought also to remember the crucial truth that Mary was a virgin. Now, in the animal world... There are a number of creatures that are capable of fertilizing themselves, acting as both male and female. For instance, there's a a lizard known as the New Mexico whiptail lizard, and all the members of that species are female. There are no male New Mexico whiptail lizards, but they are still able to reproduce. Just the females are able to reproduce. It's amazing. It's unusual, uh, even in the animal world, but it does happen, particularly with some reptiles. But that phenomenon is unheard of among human beings. What happened with Mary was miraculous. We don't have a natural explanation for it. The Holy Spirit, he worked supernaturally. He worked a miracle through his divine power. And in all of that, we can see that the triune God was involved in the coming of our Lord Jesus. The Father sent him, the Son agreed to go, and he did, and the Holy Spirit participated in his conception and in guaranteeing his sinlessness. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were together working when the Son of God came to earth as our mediator. And that leads us naturally to ask, why? What motivated God in all this? Well, to answer that, we can go back to what we read from 1 John 4. The sending of our Lord Jesus is mentioned there in the context of love. Verse 7 begins that section with a command to love one another. Why? Because, says John... Love comes from God. And God's love was supremely demonstrated in what he did with Christ's incarnation. The first coming of Jesus Christ was a picture of God's love for us. 
God was motivated by love. And do we know exactly what that means? In the world in which we live, love is often confused with all sorts of other things, often in a selfish way. Just think of that expression, making love. Fallen humanity has vandalized love and desecrated its meaning. But from Scripture, from Scripture, we know that the most striking characteristic of love is its willingness to give, its willingness to sacrifice. And isn't that what we see most clearly in the Incarnation? Think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only son. So love goes hand in hand with giving. And nowhere is this seen more clearly than in the gift of the eternal Son of God, our mediator. He came from God and he came for us. Well, now let's look in more detail at what that means. The fact that he came for us and the the comfort it gives us. Now, there are several places in Scripture that refer to Jesus Christ as our mediator. And one of those places is found in what we read from 1 Timothy 2. In verse 5, we read that there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, notice how Paul draws special attention there to the human of Christ, the man Christ Jesus, he says. Now, obviously, Christ's human nature is of critical importance for his being our mediator. Now, we might ask why that is. Why couldn't he have been a mediator who just had a divine nature, who was only God? Well, to answer that, we need to think a little bit more about what a mediator does. In biblical terms, as I mentioned before, a mediator is someone who restores a broken relationship, a hostile relationship. And in this instance, the relationship that's being restored or reconciled is the one between a holy God and man. And we have a special name for this relationship between God and humanity. We call it the covenant. The covenant is the relationship between God and man. And so when we speak about Christ as our mediator, we should be clear that he is the mediator of the covenant of grace. That's what Hebrews 12.24 teaches us, calling Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. So the covenant of grace needs to have a mediator in order to function properly. God's justice demanded that he would be eternally angry with humanity because of their sin. And in that scenario, it would be impossible for God to have any friendly relationship with humanity at all. And so it was necessary that we have someone who could step in and intervene on our behalf for us. We needed someone who wouldn't only plead with God for us, but do something. Also satisfy God's justice and remove every offense, past, present, and future. With such a mediator, humanity could be restored into fellowship with God. And this mediator needed to be a true man. Remember from Lord's Day 6 that the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned must pay for sin. Sin needs to be atoned for through suffering and death. The divine nature could not suffer and die. God cannot suffer and die on a cross. Therefore, satisfaction of God's wrath 
the turning away of his wrath, what we call propitiation, the turning away of his wrath had to come through a man. But at the same time, this mediator also needed to be true God. One who is only a man, only a human being, when it would inevitably be destroyed by the immense weight of God's wrath against sin. And a mere man would never be able to pay the price completely to God for so much sin. An infinite penalty. No, to restore this covenant fellowship, we needed a mediator who is both true God and true man. And in Jesus Christ, we find a mediator who has the right qualifications for the job. Not only is he true God and true man, he was and he is also completely innocent and perfectly holy, set apart from sin. And this was also one of the qualifications needed for the mediator of the covenant of grace. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In that passage, we're told that it's comforting to know that we have someone in heaven who understands us. He knows because he is one of us. He has lived here on this earth. But the good news is that the comfort goes even further. Verse 16 of Hebrews 4. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Having a perfect mediator who shares our human nature and has a divine nature means that we can go to God with faith fully trusting that he will give us mercy and grace when we most need it. And loved ones, I, I want to show you how that truth works in two different ways. And please pay attention here because both of these ways will encourage you. Both of these ways will comfort you. We confess from the Bible that we are all conceived and born in sin. Like it or not, the Bible tells us, and, and we know from experience, that we remain sinners until the day of our natural death or until Christ returns. However, the good news is that when we trust in the mediator of the covenant, when we trust in Jesus Christ, the righteous, we are declared right with God. We call that justification. Justification, being declared right by God. Though we remain sinners in practice, we are declared righteous in principle. That means that should we die, or should our Lord Jesus return, whichever happens first, we are guaranteed a place in God's presence. We are righteous in God's sight, Christ, the mediator of the covenant, he guarantees it. And he does that through his suffering and death, but also through his complete innocence and perfect holiness. These two things. Reformed theologians have described his innocence and perfect holiness as the active obedience of Christ. And his active obedience, his complete sinlessness, his total obedience to the law of God is credited to us. It's imputed to us. We have it as a gift. When we believe in this Savior, all the innocence and the holiness of Christ covers us. And God no longer sees our sin in which we were conceived and born. He no longer sees the sin which stains our lives every day. The curse of sin is removed. 
Here we see the awe-inspiring grace of God at work, and we're filled with praise. We want to say, thank you, Lord, for this justification. But the good news gets better. And that the grace of God doesn't stop at our justification. As if we get in fellowship with God by grace, but then we have to stay in by our good works, by our efforts. Christ is the mediator of the covenant. Not only in our justification, but also in our sanctification. Sanctification is that process by which we grow in holiness. So justification, we're declared right by God as judge. Sanctification, we're growing in holiness. And Christ is the mediator of both of these, both justification and sanctification. Sometimes people seem to think that Jesus is good for the beginning of the Christian life. We need him to get us started. But then it's up to us. Then it's up to us to do our part, to power through the rest of the way. God does his part, and now we have to do ours. However, loved ones, what is this relationship we have with God called? It's called a covenant of Grace. Grace. Christ is our mediator in this covenant of grace. Not only at the beginning of our Christian life, justification, but also through all the struggles with sin that follow afterwards. Our sanctification too. The key teaching here is our union with Christ through faith. And through the Holy Spirit who lives in him and lives in us. We have that spiritual connection because we have that Holy Spirit in common connecting us to Jesus. We're united to Christ. And so his obedience throughout his life, his holiness, becomes ours. Not only in principle, in our justification, but also in practice. In our sanctification. It's so important for us to understand. Sanctification, the process of growing in holiness, is first of all the work of Christ. And Lord's Day 32, quite a bit further down in the, in the catechism, captures that biblical way of thinking when it answers the question of why we must do good works by saying this, this really surprising statement. Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image. Note that the question was about us. Why must we yet do good works? But then the answer is about what Christ does in the first place. Eventually it gets to us as well. But the focus, the, what's up front, right in your face, is what Jesus does. The mediator of the covenant not only works on God's side of the covenant, he also works on ours. He's working in us and through us. Now, that's a perfect mediator. That's a great savior. That's a savior that we can worship, that we will worship. And for each and every one of us gathered here this afternoon, whether you're a member or you're a visitor, whether you're an adult or a child, doesn't matter who you are, we're all called to believe in this Savior. And rejecting his call, if you say, no, I don't want it, I don't want him, that means covenant breaking. That means disfellowship. That means living distant from God. That means living at enmity with God, hostility with God. Believing in Jesus Christ simply means embracing the mediator of the covenant. The only one who can bring us near to God. The only one who can bring us into God's family. He is the eternal son of God who became one of us so that he could save us. 
He is the mediator of the covenant of grace who reveals to us God's love and his compassion for undeserving sinners. Loved ones, believe in him. And though you die, yet you will live. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, how we're filled with praise for you again this afternoon. Who is like you, our great God? Again, you've shown us your love and compassion in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you that in your love, you sent him into this world. Lord Jesus, we praise you for taking on our human nature. We praise you, Lord, as the sinless one, the one who with his perfect innocence and holiness covers our sin in which we were conceived and born, the sin which continues to be so pervasive in our lives. We praise you, Lord Jesus, as the mediator of the covenant of grace. We thank you, Lord, that your perfect obedience is given to us so that we can not only be right with the Father, but also walk in holiness in increasing measures. And Holy Spirit, we praise you that you work the holy conception of our Lord Jesus. We praise you for bringing all his benefits to bear in our lives. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you as the one God of our salvation. Help us evermore to embrace Christ, the Savior. We pray that each one of us here this afternoon would truly believe in Jesus, the only mediator. Well, Father, please help us with your Holy Spirit to that end. We pray in the name of the one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. Amen. Let's sing together hymn 24. Bye. 
battle won. Now at the Father's side he reigns, Christ Jesus God the Son. Psalm 89 is what we call a messianic psalm. It's a psalm which very explicitly and directly points to Christ, and it's quoted as such in the New Testament. We're going to sing that after our collection. We'll sing Psalm 89, stanzas 1 and 2. Right now you have the opportunity to worship God with your offerings. The collection is for the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. of your great love, O Lord, to ages yet to come, make known your faithful word, for with my mouth I will to every generation proclaim your faithfulness in joyful adoration your covenant love stands firm it will not wane or waver for you in heaven itself established it forever. You said I've made a covenant with my chosen one. To David as my servant I my love have shown. For I to him have sworn, your offspring I will favor. I will establish your descendants reign forever. Your kingdom will endure, for I laid its foundations. And I will build your throne throughout all 
generations. Let's again pray together. O oh God, our great Father, we do indeed joyfully adore your faithfulness. We're so thankful for your covenant love, which stands firm, never waning or wavering, but established in heaven forever. We thank you that we can know ourselves to be secure in this relationship that we have with you. Thank you for your goodness in proclaiming to us that good news again today. And we thank you that this afternoon we're able to contribute to the further proclamation of the gospel by taking a collection for the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. Thank you, Father, that we can participate in that great work of preparing men for ministry. We pray, Father, that you would bless those who are on the front lines of that work in Hamilton, in Canada. Bless those at the seminary who are doing the teaching. We pray for the professors, that you would help them to be faithful in their calling. Help them to be effective teachers in the classroom, effective communicators of the truth of your word. We pray that they would be good mentors for the students. And we do pray for the students as well, that you would give them diligence, give them perseverance for their studies, especially as they're drawing closer to the end of another academic year. We pray, Father, that these young men who have a desire to preach the gospel, that that desire would come to fruition, that all of them would be able to serve as pastors or as missionaries for your church. And the gospel. We do pray, Father, that you would raise up more men who have a desire to preach the gospel. We pray that you would even raise up such men from here among us. We pray that you would give young men a passion for the gospel, a desire to make Jesus Christ known to the ends of the earth. And we pray that you would work that desire with your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would provide us with the workers because the need is so great. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless those who are leading our congregation. We pray for our deacons and their ministry of mercy. We pray that through our deacons, the love, the compassion, the mercy of our Lord Jesus would be demonstrated to people in our church and also outside our church community. We pray that you would give them what they need for their work. We pray for our elders too. Please bestow upon them a rich measure of your Holy Spirit so that they can do their work effectively. Bless our elders in their work of home visits. We pray, Father, that as the elders come to visit us, we can be open with them. We can have good spiritual conversations with them. That we can be encouraged and built up by their ministry. We pray that you would give our elders the wisdom and the courage that they need for their work. Please bless them and help them as they do their office. And we also thank you for our pastor. We thank you, Father, for the work that he does in preaching and teaching from week to week, the work that he does in visiting and providing leadership in all sorts of different ways. Would you please continue to bless him with health and energy for his work? We pray, Father, that his ministry here would be a rich blessing to us. We pray that you would be with his wife, Rachel, and their family as well, that they would be able to support him in that work. We pray, Father, that through all of that, your name would be praised. Your name would be lifted up and glorified in us. We pray that you would be with us this week as we gather together for Bible study again. 
Thank you that we have the opportunity to study your word, not only individually, but also together. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be present among us, leading us in the truth of your word, and also leading us to encourage one another. We pray, Father, that our Bible study time would be a time of mutual blessing and encouragement. We also pray for the catechism classes. We pray, Father, that the youth of the church would not only understand with their minds the truths of your word, but that they would also have their hearts gripped by it. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in them and through the catechism instruction that they receive. Father God, we depend on you as we go into another week. And so we acknowledge you, we acknowledge your sovereign power and love, and we ask for your mercy and favor. We know that your blessing is indispensable. We cannot do without it. We need you to go with us. So would you please be near to each and every one of us, guide us in all our ways, and help us above all to fight the good fight of the faith for your praise and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing as our concluding song this afternoon, Psalm 124. What if the Lord had not been on our side? Let Israel declare this far and wide. Our God now sends us out into the world, and he sends us with his blessing. Receive that blessing in faith. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.